So I wanted to talk today about modelling financial price data, which is an important subject in its own right. Now, inevitably, this is flavoured by my previous research experience in terms of modelling cryptocurrency data, but it is an important subject in its own right. What's quite unusual in terms of master's finance teaching is that this does touch on you know, contemporary research themes. That's very rare. We're going to use R to analyse this financial price data. So it's just simply the case that analysis is not possible using common alternatives such as SPSS and Excel. And I think you're beginning to see here the need for using a proper programming language throughout all of this. Now, there are certain things here that are easier to do using eViews compared to R because eViews is specialist financial software. However, I still think that R is useful because you still need to understand everything that is going on in order to get the programming to work. Also, I would say the other thing here is that you're less dependent upon the programming options that are installed in various different versions of eViews precisely because you've got a lot more flexibility with the R programming. Okay, so you'd have to use R or eViews to do this rather than SPSS or Excel. Here we're going to use R. So as an overview of the subject then, so subject is inherently quantitative, but it's a core part of finance. So my background, I've got a PhD in maths, but I actually won a finance prize last year for analysis of cryptocurrency markets. So it's inherently quantitative, bordering on the mathematical, but it's still a core part of finance. List of potential applications here includes econometric studies, options pricing, risk management, etc. It's often a core part of dissertation, so I've supervised uh, a few dissertations now on related things, uh, not just restricted to cryptocurrency applications, although cryptocurrencies do make a good topic for dissertations, and I've supervised both undergraduate and postgraduate dissertations on this. So, the subject material in this late lecture is often a core part of dissertations now some key take-home messages here you need to model the percentage price change it's not obvious a priori that's what we have to do it's usually simplified in practice to modeling the log returns and again sometimes some of the jargon here can make this thing look harder more complicated than it really is log returns are just the first differences of the log price okay so you almost never model the price directly you in practice usually model the log returns, which are the first differences of the log price. So just to give an overview and a flavour of what's going on here. So the modelling of price data from cryptocurrencies is a live topic of academic research. And really it's rare that in MSc courses like this that we cover something that's both so topical and so close to the cutting edge of contemporary finance research. So there's a paper there that I've cited by one of my uh, former colleagues, Paris Gevi Katsiampa, published in 2017, which is relatively recent and has been very highly cited. So the topic of today's lecture extends from the classical study of statistical models for stock price data. So the modelling of financial price data is important anyway. And then I wanted to put a sort of flavour of cryptocurrency in, in here, just because that's where some of my recent research interests have been on the subject and this is not intended as an ideological judgment in itself that cryptocurrencies are more of a speculative asset than a genuine currency okay it's just that the natural starting point here is to start by modeling stock price data and then extend that to prices from other financial assets okay and this is a sort of classical study in and of itself but i think it's nice to to cover contemporary applications such as cryptocurrencies. Again, rather close to contemporary cutting edge finance research. So in terms of the data that we model then, you almost never model a price index directly. Okay, so this is sort of quite counterintuitive. Perhaps it's usually more informative to look at the percentage change in price. So you can define here the returns, which is just the difference of the of today's price minus yesterday's price all over yesterday's price so the idea with that is that you've got some 
notion of scale and direction. So if the return is positive, then the price has increased from yesterday, and then the scale of this just gives you the, the idea of how large the size of the effect is. So if the return is large and positive, the price has gone up a lot compared to yesterday. If the return is large and negative, then the price has gone down a lot compared to yesterday. Usually what would happen for stable financial assets is lots of these returns are very, very small. So there's incremental changes usually in prices between one day and the next. So the returns have been defined there. In practice, usually easier to look at the log returns. So what you would do is look at the log of the price and the log returns are just the difference in the log price between today and yesterday. And the laws of logs, you can write that as a log of the ratio of today's price over yesterday's price. So similar to one of the points I wanted to raise straight away in the early lectures, the name of the game is really communication. And what we're doing here is that we tend to look at percentage price changes as these are usually more informative. So they give an indication of both scale and direction so you can sort of see how much the price has changed and tell whether the price has increased or decreased from yesterday. So some simple examples then, so if you're told the price today is £100, so the idea is that this piece of information does not make sense in isolation. So was the price yesterday £5 or £300 or £99 or whatever? You don't know whether the price has increased, whether things are looking good, or the price has decreased, things are looking bad, and you also don't know by how much. Okay, so there's crucial information here on the direction and the scale that's not included in this information in point one. Now, if you're told in contrast that the difference between today's price and yesterday's price is 10 pence, so, okay, you can tell that the price increased slightly, but this piece of information doesn't make sense in isolation. So was the price yesterday £5.50 or 50 pence? If it's £5.50, it might be a relatively small price change. If it's 50, it was 50 pence yesterday, it might be a ginormous price change. So what is going on here then is, is that if we look at the percentage price changes, these give an added sense of scale and direction. And again, the main point of any set of quantitative methods is communication. So for instance, if the return value was 0 0.0003, this would mean that the price has increased by 0.03% compared to yesterday's value. If the return was in contrast minus 0 0.0002, this would mean the price has decreased by 0.02% compared to yesterday's value. So especially when they are calculated over short time horizons like days and weeks, these sort of asset price returns tend to show quite low values unless the market is extremely volatile. So I guess this is one of the reasons here why cryptocurrencies are so interesting to look at in terms of the price data because they're known to be so volatile. But usually when you look at asset price returns, these tend to show quite low value. So if you think of, say, Tesco's or Sainsbury's supermarket, you'd expect, as these are well-established companies, that the stock price remains relatively stable over a given time period. So as a consequence of that, you'd expect these return values to be relatively low. Now, as an indication of this, 22% isn't necessarily a large number, but in terms of returns, this is ginormous. So this is as far as these price returns. So I wanted to sort of try and give an indication of where the log returns data that we look at comes from. So it clearly makes sense to look at the returns because you've got this then sense of scale and direction but the usual convention is instead to look at the series of log returns and there's a number of reasons for this so firstly tractability and consistency with standard mathematical finance models the log return series are typically approximately stationary so easier to model statistically and these log return series are typically approximately uncorrelated so easier to model statistically so they have desirable uh, statistical properties which makes them convenient to work with 
and they are also provide a good match with some of the standard mathematical finance models such as the Black Scholes model. So there are a couple of notes I wanted to make here. Firstly, there's usually not much difference between looking at the returns and the log returns, and I'll show you why that is in a moment. Uh, also, although we would wish this to be nice and simple, it isn't. Being uncorrelated is not the same as being independent, and we'll show you some examples of this later in the lecture. So this is intended to demonstrate that finance is difficult, and any mathematical model will necessarily be quite a crude simplification. I wanted to just try and demonstrate here that the log returns are consistent with standard mathematical finance models, such as the Black Scholes model, for which Scholes and Merton won the Nobel Prize in Economics. So this isn't examinable, but I just wanted to sort of try and show you where this is coming from. So the Black Scholes model is the classical differential equation here. To worry about that, if you have this model, in this case, the log returns. We have a normal distribution with this mean given by the integral and the variance given by the integral. So in this case, where you've got this idealized mathematical finance model, the log returns possess desirable statistical properties in that they are independent and normally distributed. Okay, real price data don't have this property. But still, this model is a useful yardstick with which to compare genuine financial market data. Okay, and it's just sort of easier if you use these log returns as the natural reference point because they are consistent with elements of financial theory such as the Black Scholes options pricing model. Okay, so there is some finance theory here lurking in the background. It's nice to be aware of it. Again, this is non-examinable. What I just wanted to sort of try and demonstrate here mathematically is that in a practical basis, there is almost no difference at all between looking at returns and log returns. And all this information here on the slide, this is as rigorous mathematically as I could get it. This is just to show you that the returns and the log returns that you tend to use in practice are actually very close to each other. So there is a minimal difference between the two from a practical basis, especially because the returns values will typically be very, very small. So if you look at the final line of the equation here, if these are of the order of at most, say, 0.2, then the difference will be no bigger than some number times by 0.2 squared. So genuinely, very, very small in practice. OK, so it doesn't make much difference then compared to if you look at the log returns or the actual returns. They both give the same sense of scale and direction of price movement. And the practical differences between the two will be very, very marginal. It's just that it's often easier to work with the log returns compared to the actual returns. So in terms of the outline of the rest of the lecture, I wanted to talk first about some computational work with price data in R. And then I wanted to talk about the random walk model. So it's not so relevant necessarily for your assessment, but I just couldn't resist here because this serves as interesting historical background and motivation. And it's partly why I became interested in finance in the first place. Then I wanted to talk about stylized empirical facts. So these are important for two reasons, really. Firstly, I've used these in assessments a lot of the time in the past, both for exams and for courseworks. And they are also quite a nice thing for me to set for dissertation students. And I've had dissertation students working on this in the past. So what these are, are a description of how real asset markets work and how real asset price data behaves. So since stock price data is so widely studied, a range of stylized empirical facts typically shared by stock price data from around the world are widely documented. And this forms a natural yardstick to compare with any financial data that you see at all. And it's natural for me here to mention things like Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, 
partly because this matches my research interests, partly also I've supervised dissertation students on this topic in the past, and I'll talk about some tests of stylized empirical facts towards the end of the lecture.